Our next speaker is uh, Ryan Naru, who's a vehicle standards engineer at Uber Elevate. Um, he began his career in aviation as an aircraft maintenance technician at Northeast Aero, where he specialized on the Cirrus SR-20 and SR-22 airframes. Later, he studied aer aerospace engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology, where he led original research into the maintenance challenges unique to electric aircraft. He gained eVTOL design experience while working for a confidential startup focused on urban air mobility. He holds a BS in economics with a specialization in policy analysis from Binghamton University and an AS in engineering science from SUNY Orange. Please welcome Ryan. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Very excited to talk to you today about uh, sort of the state of where uh, we see eVTOL vehicle development going. And I think that it's really important as uh, a first step to define what are the requirements? What is Uber looking for in an EV tall aircraft? Now, let's see where we were on the roadmap really quick. And we're going to try this out. There we go. And so, uh, as Mike was saying, in October 2016, the Elevate white paper came out and really signaled sort of our intent to be a motivator in this industry, uh, with 2017 being the inaugural, inaugural Elevate Summit. So one of the key pieces of Uber Elevate is that it's developing an industry ecosystem. It's the place uh, that we can build the confidence in electric vertical takeoff and landing technology uh, among all of our partners and among all of industry. So we're trying to, to ri rise the tide, lifts all ships. We've been developing our computer simulation technology. I'll be showing you that in just a moment with uh, the Flux Network Simulation Tool. Uh, in 2019, actually just last week, we had our first full week of operations of Ubercopter, demonstrating through our, our traditional ride app in New York City the ability to do multimodal aerial ride sharing. <clears throat> and in 2020, as Mike said, we're going to be looking at having our first eVTOL demonstration flights. And looking ahead further in time, 2023 is our initial certified operations. We hope that uh, some of our vehicle partners will have uh, their initial certified vehicles by that point. We've identified three cities, Dallas, Los Angeles, and Melbourne uh, in Australia to be our initial launch markets. By 2026, we hope to be optimizing and expanding our network and by 2028, we believe that the second generation vehicles will be coming online. Those may have some autonomous technologies uh, for autonomous flight and also lean design for scaled manufacturing because we believe that as the scaled operations grow, there's going to be a remarkable demand for airframes to be constructed at a rate never seen before uh, in aviation. So what Uber brings to the table is our really impressive uh, knowledge of how people move throughout cities. We've developed the Flux data tool to understand how a trip flows through cities uh, change throughout the daytime. Uh, so for example, you can see hot spots where there are trip inflows. So traditionally in the morning, maybe in a central business district and away from residential areas. We can take this information to map the hot spots and combine this with a demand model uh, where we are doing a trade-off between how people value their time uh, and their money. And if you can see, uh, this would be a very comparable cost at scale to an Uber X or an Uber uh, Black uh, initially, but saving a lot of time. The other thing that I'll have you note on this chart is the fact that this is a multimodal trip. So what would happen is through your Uber app, you would request a trip, you'd be presented with options. Um, and if you decided to choose Uber Air, you'd have a vehicle pick you up, bring you to a Skyport. You'd then transition from your vehicle into uh, Uber Air eVTOL. Once you arrive at your destination Skyport, you'd then transition out of the vehicle and into your final mode of transportation, be it another Uber car or, for example, maybe some of our uh, new mobility solutions such as the scooters or bikes. So combining that demand model with uh, how we understand hotspots and of demand, 
We can instantiate uh, an, an ideal sort of network of nodes. So these would be the locations where you may see skyports one day in the future in Dallas. And again, I want to emphasize the point that this is a multimodal solution. So we're not trying to connect just very high demand places with other very high demand places. We, we have to recognize that there's a, a very high cost to the switching portion of the trip. And so we need to emphasize the importance of speed and efficiency. And so from that, we're able to develop our system requirements. Again, we believe that uh, for a very successful urban air mobility network, we need a vehicle that can cruise at 150 miles an hour. We believe that in order to amortize the cost of these vehicles, especially the battery, uh, we need to be able to carry uh, a pooled payload uh, of one pilot initially and up to four passengers. As we transition to autonomy, perhaps that pilot then becomes an, another possible rider seat. We believe that the total maximum flight range of the vehicles doesn't need to be any more than 60 miles. And I know that that seems like a very short amount. Um, and actually, the typical trip is usually much shorter than that, on the order of 10 to 15 miles. And what you'll see is in our three-hour sprint, the vehicle in the five minutes that it's on the ground uh, at the Skyport is actually doing a rapid recharge. So you'll see a sawtooth sort of pattern on the, on the battery model. It's extremely important for community acceptance that these vehicles are quiet. So 15 decibels lower than uh, the stage three requirements in part 65 for helicopters. Um, we also want to think about not just being lower in noise on a decibel scale, but also be thinking about sort of the time varying loudness aspects. So the very choppy, wop wop type of noise of a helicopter is a very disruptive sound. We want to try and incentivize vehicles that have a much smoother sound, uh, taking into account sort of how people uh, perceive sound is very important. All electric and highly reliable. We, we need to make sure that these vehicles are operating 2,000 hours or more in a year. So uh, I think it's really uh, excellent to then take a look at sort of what are the of the range of solutions that we have in the EV tall space, which ones will work uh, for the network requirements that we've defined. There we are. So some of the initial vehicles, which I'm sure many of the aviation buffs in the room have seen flying already, uh, are non-wing multi-rotors, essentially vehicles that have no transition phase of flight. Instead, they rely on fixed propeller uh, angles. So for example, you have the Volocopter, the E-Hang, and the Airbus City Airbus. Um, these vehicles, um, they're going to be very slow. Uh, they're going to have a lot of edgewise flow over the rotors. Uh, so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge there, as in particular when it comes to noise. There, there are RPM-based controls, uh, and the edgewise flight contribute highly to the, to the noise problem. And as, because they're relying on powered lift and not transitioning to a wing, what's happening is the mission uh, that you're able to fly is very short, um, given the current state of battery technology. So these vehicles don't necessarily work very well for the Uber Air mission. There are advantages to these vehicles. Uh, we do see that they are typically less complex. Um, so we do have a, a metric system by which we, we look at sort of the number of components that are on a vehicle. I, this is the uh, City Airbus. And I actually think that uh, personally that the City Airbus may be a little bit underscored here because it uses uh, electric motors that require coolant systems. Uh, so the SP200D is, is a coolant uh, required electric motor. So it would have a lower complexity score to our notional Uber uh, ECRM4 vehicle, which has lots of articulating components. Uh, for example, the wingtip thrusters will, will tilt forward in flight to transition to wingborne lift. Um, lots of aerodynamic controls, the electric motors on the wheels. So it, it's a much more complicated vehicle. And so there is a cost to that. And so we are taking that into account, but one of the things that a distributed electric propulsion vehicle can do is, compared to a helicopter, remove the part criticality. So for example, on a helicopter, you have a, a very large number of mechanical parts that are flight safety critical. That is, 
There is no redundancy, for example, in tail motor structures or mechanisms. And so as a result, there's a very high cost to the manufacturing, maintenance, and operation of these vehicles. Electric propulsion and distributed electric propulsion allows us, if it's done smartly, to get away from that part criticality and embrace redundancy. So this is a, a chart that we've developed to kind of score some of the concepts that are out there based on our ideals. And on the y-axis, you'll notice that there, it, it's a, a product score of both complexity and criticality. So what we're doing is we're, we're measuring sort of the total number of parts, but also applying a score to how critical uh, those parts are after doing a Famica analysis. And so for example, uh, and on the, on the x-axis, you'll see that that's a performance score, where we're, we're measuring the, the cruise lift and drag, so that's essentially a, a stand-in for your efficiency in the cruise flight mode, uh, times the speed. So how many missions can we accomplish in that three-hour sprint with this vehicle? Now, because the uh, multi-rotors uh, are not meeting our performance requirements in terms of speed, uh, and also in terms of their energy availability, we, don't even, we can't even really consider them. And so what we look at mostly for Uber Air are lift plus cruise and vectored thrust concepts. Now, if we then look at you know, how these score on a, on a Pareto frontier, we want to get down to the bottom right. That's where we see the goodness of an eVTOL. So embracing complexity uh, in order to uh, increase mission performance but also embracing redundancy in a smart way, so not being excessively redundant, so that way we always will potentially have a maintenance failure, right? We don't want to have 36 propulsors, let's say, perhaps there's a, a, a correct amount of redundancy to improve operational reliability. Um, and you'll see, for example, that a, a tri-rotor will score very poorly, even though its performance perhaps is very good. So there is, there is a Pareto ideal, and we are trying to get to the bottom right. I also want to, uh, you'll see that simplicity is sometimes suggested as, as a stand-in metric for safety. Um, I think that simplicity perhaps is a stand-in metric for how easy it might be to certify a vehicle, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is a safer vehicle. We embrace complexity all the time in general aviation all the way up to commercial aviation to increase aircraft performance. And so we believe that you can, in a smart way, increase the aircraft performance, for example, with vectored thrust um, by embracing complexity. So simplicity does not necessarily equal safety. And as I was saying, redundancy and reliability minus criticality is our interpretation of how you would achieve a safe vehicle. So again, the ideal Uber Air eVTOL is one that has high speed, sufficient payload to amortize the costs of the vehicle over uh, the life of the vehicle, and sufficient range in order to have an adequate market that satisfies sort of the demand of the cities that we hope to operate in. We want the vehicle to be green. We're embracing uh, electric battery technology for, for these vehicles. We're not pointing to hybrids at this time, just because, as was uh, alluded to in the last presentation, there are many cities now that are uh, prohibiting new internal combustion engine vehicles from operating in the city. We believe that the right path forward for uh, a simple vehicle with low maintenance costs also is also to be an all-electric vehicle. These vehicles need to be quiet, as I said before. If we want them to be adopted in these cities, we need to be uh, prioritizing how these vehicles' uh, acoustic signature uh, is developed. So what we're doing through our vehicle engineering team is developing tool sets and tool chains that we're sharing with our community in order to make sure that we're designing the quietest vehicles possible. And also we're, we're, we're stressing the importance of safety. These vehicles need to be extremely safe both on an engineering level but also in how they're operated. We believe that driving out operator error is probably one of the most significant things that uh, we can do to increase the actual level of safety 
uh, of general aviation and commercial aviation vehicles. 70% uh, are operator related incidents. And so we're putting a really strong priority on that. But also distributed electric propulsion, like I said before, offers you the opportunity to have a fail functional vehicle. So these are our partners. Again, you'll look at the vehicles uh, on the board and you'll see that all of them are relying on a wing. Uh, a wing-based EV tall is, we believe, the right path forward uh, for Uber Air. Thank you. <laughs>